Written Together, Episode 1.01, .01. Interstitial 1, Q&A with Janice. Hello. Hello, I'm Summer. I'm Janice. I'm Dee. I'm Kevin. And this is Written, Written Together. Together. Every season, we work collaboratively, collaboratively to tell a different story. Each episode of the season, one of us extends the story from where the last person left off. The rest of us don't know what's in store, so it's an adventure for, for everyone. everyone. Yeah, like what they call yeah. an interstitial. Interstitial. A... Thank you, I can never say it right. So, join us for fun. For mystery. Creativity. But most of all, to be delighted by stories written, written together. together. Hey there, everybody. This is Kevin, and today I'm sitting down with Janice to grill her on her writing process. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me today, Janice. I, I really do appreciate it. My pleasure, always. Since this is season one of the show, people don't really know who we are or what to expect from our writing, right? So, um, so I was thinking it might be a good idea to sit down and chat with each writer before their first segment airs to help the audience get a better feel for them. And uh, and since your first segment is coming up soon, you get to be the first person in the hot seat, as it were. Since I have the first episode, yeah. No panic there. <laughs> but I also love the idea, I love the idea that each of us is going to be able to kind of give everyone a sense of who we are, how we write, and, you know, just kind of get introduced in a different way other than just being able to like hear our episodes gives them a little more insight into, you know, that part of us. I think it's very cool. My plan here is to ask the same battery of questions to each person. So. Ooh, very James Lipton inside the actor's studio. I love it. <laughs> right? <laughs> so all I need is the black background and a table and maybe a smoking jacket and we're all set. Yeah. So have a very smug look on my face, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's start from the top. Just jump right into it. Are there therapeutic benefits to modeling a character after someone you know? Oh, that is a great question. I love how that one's like right off the bat. It's like, tell me about your childhood, you know? Um, I would say absolutely. I feel like a lot of times it is very therapeutic because it is a way to get out some of the feelings that you've had about particular people. I don't like to use one person Per character, I like to put like a conglomeration of them, like a, a big hodgepodge of like, oh, these are the people that made me feel this particular kind of way. And so this is what's making up the character. In the novel that I'm currently shopping to an agent, I have a particular character that has a mixture of different people in it, but some people will be able to hear one person in particular because they're very familiar with that person. And so it's kind of like you hear it and you're just like, hmm, this sounds an awful lot like this person. And it's like, well, yeah, but not really. So it does allow you to kind of pull that out of yourself. It also allows you to create a brand new way of closure for yourself. So like if there is something like really on your mind and you've put this character together and you put them through whatever it is you've put them through. Uh, it kind of allows you to let that person go and be apart from it because you're not emotionally attached at this point. At this point, it's a character in the story and it no longer affects you the way it used to. So yeah, it can be incredibly therapeutic and sometimes it can be um, not so much <laughs> like you because what you, sometimes you can create a, another character that does the things that the other, that people in your real life don't do that you wish that they did. And that can cause further problem. And so that's the balance that you have to have as a writer to be able to say, okay, am I using this vicariously to be able to live out this part of the life that I was never allowed to live out? Um, and so you have to be very careful with that because then it's like, what is it going to change in your memory bank? as you are writing, will that change how you remember things and cause them to, to shift in your mind? Or, you know, are you seeing them for what they really are? So I try to keep away from the second one as much as possible. Cause I'm like, nah, I don't want to make, you know, fairy tales come true in that aspect. 
I'm like, hey, I already have enough problems distinguishing reality from fiction when I'm writing. So I leave that one alone. But yeah, definitely you can, it can be very therapeutic. But always being mindful of not letting that shift um, too far into becoming almost like a living fantasy. Yeah. Because then that fantasy can have very real emotional impacts on you as a real person. Yes, absolutely. It can become very detrimental. And so, you know, you want to be very careful with the extreme connections to your characters. You want to keep them kind of at a distance. It's not easy, but it's definitely doable. Well, speaking of characters, which comes first for you, the plot or the character? And is there any particular thought process to why one would come before the other? So this is a, this is one of those questions that, um, can have different answers for every single writer or even every single story. Cause sometimes you get this idea of, oh, you know, it would be really great. This plot, if I could only find the characters to be able to put in it. And then other times the character will come fully formed to you. You know, we'll, we'll come knocking at your door and be like, Hey, this would be very interesting because this is who I am. And this is, you know, the story that would happen. And so for me, it, my stories are very character driven more than plot driven. I want people to invest in the characters that I create, even if it's something that's like a, like we're, what we're doing for written together, which is like the writing prompt, the writing prompt just says a person. Okay. The person has to come to me to be able to, for me to be able to see what the story is about. So even though we have this kind of premise in place, the rest of the story has to kind of unravel itself based on the person that appears for me. So it is very character driven. I see the person and I'm like, oh, this is what you're going through. And this is why this is happening in this particular way. As opposed to, you know, I have this plot and everybody has to adhere to this plot. And you know, it's interesting. And I think what we're doing here works so well because of this, uh, it allows the, the, it allows the writers who are more plot driven to not necessarily have to worry about a lot of the character detail because the other writers who are character driven will help lay that groundwork for us. Right. Which is exciting for me as a character driven writer to be able to write the first episode, because if I'm writing the first episode, I'm establishing what the characters look like, what they feel like, what, what all the characters that are going to be introduced, kind of giving them this feel before the next person comes in. And that allows them to not have to concentrate on that so much. It's like, okay. It's a little more alleviating for the second person, which, you know, is kind of nice. Would I like to be that person? Absolutely. But <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it does make our job a little easier because you are laying that foundation for us. And I trust that foundation is going to be very, very solid. As I shake over here, as like my, all my thoughts for the past week have been like, am I going in the right direction for this? And that's every writer, you know, whenever you're writing, whatever, it's like, am I, am I going in the right direction for the story? Is the story going to make sense when I continue the story or if someone else picks up the story? Because, um, people don't only write books by themselves. People are co-write all the time. And so it's like, okay, am I making sense for the next person to pick it up and move along with it? And you, you want it to be something really great, but you also don't want it, you know, to, to be so far fetched that they're like, what am I supposed to do with this now? Like, I got to bring this back. Like she went all the way over here. Like I got to pull her back a little bit. So it's that trying to maintain that balance. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm very, very character, very character driven. And I, I like writing like that because for me, I want people to be very connected to the people that I write because the, the characters become real for me, they become very real in my mind. And they tell me what they're going to do next. Like once they're in my mind, it's like, okay, I wouldn't do that. I would do this. And so it's never me putting myself into the characters. It's the characters explaining to me whether they would do this or not. I mean, they all kind of live in here, you know, it's like I had to make room in my brain for this particular character, you know, when the other characters for like the books that I'm writing are 
trying to keep the same space in there. So you, you kind of touched a little bit on this in your previous response, but could you elaborate more on what you find to be the most difficult part about your writing process? I think, um, the most difficult part is the, well, there's, there are two things that become very difficult. The first is making sure that your story makes sense from beginning to end. So if you're writing a full story that this is very different from the written together part, but when you're writing a, a full story, you can see how you want it to end. You can see how it's starting. That middle part gets really muddy. And that's the part where you're just like, what do I do? So two things can happen. This happens to a lot of writers who don't end up completing manuscripts or any kind of, of story. They see the end, they see the beginning, they write to the part until they don't really know what's supposed to happen in the middle. And then they get a shiny new idea for a different story. And so we call those plot bunnies. What? <laughs> yeah. Because they hop into your mind like, hey, I know you're having a really hard time right here. So here's this shiny new story that you could start. So it's like, ooh, the shiny thing, you know, and you want to like run off and start the next thing because you're at a really difficult point of the story. And so a lot of times that can be, that can be a little difficult. So the other part for me is, uh, the world building. Really? So I, I write a lot of YA fantasy and I tend to build these worlds out that you're not really going to see, but they have to be there in order for what I'm writing to make sense. And so it's all of the additional writing that you don't see that can be very difficult. What I like to do is I like to give pieces of information from different characters as the main character goes through the story. So it's not one person saying, this is everything that you need to know. It's like, okay, I'm going to give you this piece. And it's like, okay, in order for me to figure out what I need to do next, I go to this person and this person reveals the next piece. And so you get these revelations back and forth, um, that allows you to kind of expand the world as you go. And I like to do that, but it's very hard because you really want everyone to know all of the things that you've written because, you know, I wrote all these words and I want someone to, you know, <laughs> to hear them. Oh yeah, of course. And you know, the, the backstories are really exciting when you have them in your head and people get excited about the story that you're writing, it's like, oh, but you like, you have no idea. Like, let me tell you the rest. That's kind of an advantage that the video game industry has, you know, cause what we can do is give you just the information you need to make sure that your actual experience is complete yeah. and understandable and feels natural and whatnot. And then because it's an interactive world, we can leave a like a, a book over here. Yes. And if you actually care about the extended writings of Fluffy McFluffy Pants, <laughs> then you go click on the book and read it. I completely agree. I think, I think that comes after. And you're right, the, the gaming industry has an has a advantage, but I think a lot of writers need to remember to do something like that. To remember, like, these are the essentials and people don't need to know everything at the same time. The revelations that happen as the book goes on makes it exciting for the reader to keep reading. And so you want to see what's going to happen next. You want to go along your hero's journey or anti-hero's journey, however you're writing it. Because you want them to be revealed at the same time you're reading them. You don't want to know before the, the hero. Sometimes you do. Because it's like, you get this anxious feeling like, I already know that this is going to happen and you don't know now, you know, like, don't look, you got kind of moments, like it's these awkward, cringy moments, but at the same time, like having those reveals with the main character or whichever point of view character that you're going with, it establishes this steady moving forward pace. And I think a lot of times world building or info dumping stops the story and, and makes you sit for a little bit. Now, if you have all of this excitement going on, and then you have this moment where people are like resting and, and understanding things, then yeah, by all means, put a little more information in there. Why not? Because then you need like readers need a chance to take a breath 
This is why not every chapter can be, you know, go, 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 excitement, excitement, excitement. You need a, a chance to take a breath, close the book, process what you've been reading, and then be able to go to the next segment of it. Exactly. So next question, have you ever traveled for researching a book or story? Funnily enough, yes. Um, I have, I have traveled to, well, I mean, just in the States, I wish, oh man, I wish I would have traveled like all over the place. I'm actually writing a, a historical fiction, a YA historical fiction that's set in Spain and Vienna. So Madrid and Vienna, luckily I've been to Madrid. So I, I know I didn't go for research, but I already kind of have the feel of what Madrid is obviously not in the 1500s because can't do that. But, um, I would love to, like, I was planning to, to go to, to Vienna to take a look at all the old buildings and everything like that. But in the, uh, completed manuscript that I have, I was in the Dominican Republic. And while I was on vacation there, I was able to write some of the details that I wanted in my book because it was kind of like a dual thing where it was like vacation plus research. And you're able to kind of abs uh, really absorb it in a different way. You're not just kind of relaxing on, on a beach or anything, which I did naturally, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it was going into smaller towns and, um, I was able to visit, um, a cave there, um, called Las Cuevas de las Maravillas, which is in this, like, it's very cool where you go into this cave and there are a lot of petroglyphs of the, um, indigenous people there. Oh, people. wow. Very cool. Yeah. And so part of, and that cave was like uh, amazing. And part of that cave I used for inside a mountain scene in my manuscript because how much it impacted me while I was there. And I said, this would be perfect for this scene. And so that research was really great. Now, would I love to travel to do research? Absolutely. Um, especially right now. I don't think that's very possible for a lot of places, uh, still, but I feel like if you, if you're wanting to, to get the feel of it, and I tell people this all the time, uh, and you can't go watch the 4k videos on YouTube. Ooh, yes. Look for someone who actually lives in that town. Like that has an Instagram that like loves to take photos and like goes to the local places and everything. You're able to kind of immerse yourself a little better than if you just Google or Wikipedia something, you can see how people are actually living when you're interacting in that way. You can kind of experience it that way. You know, that's, that's some really good advice. Thanks. Um, I never even considered that looking at 4k videos and people's Instagram accounts, that really would be a great way of getting that kind of immersion by proxy, yeah. I guess you would say that's good advice. Thanks. What would you say is your kryptonite as a writer? Oh, my kryptonite as a writer. Wow. That's a really good question. My kryptonite for, for me, it's deadlines. Oh, oh, deadlines. Is that all? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Those are, they're, they're, they are my kryptonite because when I, you know, how they have that saying where, um, I, I forget how exactly you say it, but it's like the work expands for the amount of time that it's given. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, um, the goldfish effect. Oh, that is a hundred percent me. It's like. Oh, I have three weeks to write this. I don't need to start writing this. It's fine. I don't need to start writing. Why well, write a write rough draft? You know, like I've been like this, like even through, even through college, it was like, oh, I have a paper due on Friday and it's Monday. So I don't have to write it until like Thursday, like Wednesday or Thursday. That's always been like the, like I'm trying to get better at that. But when I'm up against it, when I have the pressure to get it done, that's when I'm actually able to do it. But if I have a long-term, you know, no deadline. Ugh, oof. I feel you. I'm pretty much the same way. Yeah. So it's like, once I have, once I have the deadline, I'm like, eh, no, I'm fine. I'm good. You know, I'm good. Like I can estimate. Yeah. 
<laughs> that is so bad. And yeah, having a deadline and not having a deadline because having a deadline stresses me out and then not having a deadline, you have to push yourself to get to the end. Cause you know, when you're writing a, when you're writing a book and you, you're unagented, you don't have someone saying, okay, I need this book in six months or I need this book in three months. I don't have a time limit for that. And so that can be even worse. So I would say instead of deadlines, it would probably be procrastination. Procrastination is my kryptonite more than anything. Cause I am a, an A1 procrastinator. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, no mat, no mat, and it's with everything. So, you know, writing just gets the brunt of it the majority of the time. Okay, and here we are, final question. What is your favorite writing snack or drink? My favorite writing snack. Okay, so my favorite writing snack is trolley gummy worms. I mean, oh, I have to have a bag of trolley worms with me. I actually have one somewhere. I buy them, not big bags, but like the smaller bags. Cause if I have a big bag, that's going to be an issue. <laughs> like if I'm sitting here, I'm like, Ooh, I will eat until I will work until the bag is gone. And if I have like a family size bag, I am going to be awake until six o'clock in the morning with all the sugar, you know, just typing away. But yeah, the trolley gummy worms are, are my big thing. And I love to have my water. I have to have water sitting next to me, like water and coffee. Water and coffee because the coffee kind of keeps me coffee and sugar. Like, hey, you know, <laughs> coffee and trolley is the breakfast of oh champions. Uh, so, you know, I <laughs> do that and I drink water. And, you know, when you're, when you're getting into it, sometimes you forget to eat. So that's kind of what ends up happening, you know, when you're really into your storyline. That ends up happening. That's a fun question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I didn't want to build it up too much, but I did think it was a, I did think it was a kind of a fun question. It is a fun question. Yes. I can't wait to hear what everybody else says because I'm, I'm interested. Well, Janice, thank you so much for agreeing to sit down and answer some questions. I really do appreciate it. And I hope the listeners appreciate it too. It was my pleasure. Of course. Like, why wouldn't they want to hear me rambling on and on about writing, which I could probably do for another hour. <laughs> yes. Well, as much as I would like that. We should probably wrap up so that you can get back to work. You've got an episode to write. <laughs> uh, again, the procrastination is deep and real. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of this little interstitial. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. And again, thank you, Janice, for sitting down and chatting with me. Um, I will be doing this with each of the writers before their first episode comes out to help everybody kind of get to know each other just a little better. So until next time, thanks very much. I don't know. We have to work on our ending. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Background music and sound effects courtesy of Zapsplat. Check them out at zapsplat.com. If you'd like to know more about Written Together and the stories we've told, visit us at writtentogether.com.